Welcome, one and all, to an extremely late Halloween special. Why is this so late? Well, Indie Ween for once, since I wanted to make sure all the cool indie games got a shot, but also a whole lot more shenanigans that we'll get into in just a sec. Also, the script for this one, uh, kinda ran away from me. Oh boy, is my voice going to hurt after recording this. Today we're going to take a deep dive into a game that many of you asked for when I first covered the original Alone in the Dark trilogy back in July. Alone in the Dark, 2008. Now, while I will stand my ground and say that this is indeed a disaster of a revival, it's worth noting that at least financially, this was a success. Alone in the Dark 2008 moved over a million copies a month after its launch, despite its middling at best review scores and the controversy as the game's publisher, Atari, which is to say, well, the current iteration of Atari that was a rebranding of infograms because Atari is kind of like being the Dread Pirate Roberts of the game industry where many different entities have taken up the mantle over the years. Sidebar aside, according to a couple gaming news outlets at the time, Atari SA was running around threatening to sue some outlets that had broken the street date and given the game a bad review, alleging that these game outlets had been using pirated copies. These outlets claimed back that their copies were legitimate, and one even claimed that they received the copy from Atari themselves. The game's launch version's Metascore was sitting at a 58 and 55 for Xbox 360 and PC respectively, but the version we're going to play sits at a much more respectable score of 69. Nice. As you'll find out through the course of this video, those reviews were well deserved and in everything but the metrics of finance and game sales, this game is indeed a disaster. And it's not even actually a reboot either, despite everyone thinking it is. Alone in the Dark 2008 is technically Alone in the Dark 4, and the vanguard of all those soft reboots we see these days where all the previous games or movies or whatever did happen in the canon, despite this being ostensibly an entirely new story with the only similarities being recognizable names. We are still following the exploits of Detective Edward Carnby in what is the fourth chronological game in the Alone in the Dark series. Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare, the game between this one and Alone in the Dark 3, was the actual reboot that didn't seem to go anywhere, so it's just ignored in canon. Alone in the Dark 2008 is a buggy, poorly optimized, and frankly, if I could sum up everything about this game in a single phrase, I'd say the gameplay feels like no one was around to tell all the developers and designers, no, don't add that yet, finish all the other features you started first. Because the game's design is all over the place and nothing feels refined or even finished at times. Speaking of unfinished, do you ever find yourself not being able to finish your own projects because you're too busy cooking and what you cook leaves you unsatisfied and opening that delivery app on your phone? Well, that's totally cool, man. You don't need to use any sort of fancy service to learn how to meal prep. And just like everything else in life, getting good at cooking comes with time and practice. Maybe one of these days I will revisit meal prepping for a cooking segment with a focus on doing it in an easy, low cost manner to help you all get started. In the meantime, let's take the rest of this minute that might've been spent on an ad read that we'd all have skipped anyway and just enrich ourselves, relax. Take a second to unclench your jaw, lower your shoulders if you got them scrunched up, and just try to loosen up and right yourself in your seat if you're sitting. You don't have to sit up completely upright and rigid, but a good way to try to do it is to imagine you've got invisible puppet strings holding you upright. I'm personally not the best at doing this myself as I am literally slouching a bit now recording this, but making any effort is better than none at all. Now let's go get alone in the dark. Now, before I get into the pain that was getting this game running, recordable, recorded, and then able to be edited, let's talk about why I do this in the first place. Alone in the Dark was the survival horror game, as in it's arguably the first one to exist, at least as we understand them. Alone in the Dark debuted in 1992 as an Infograms production and pioneered the fixed camera 3D system we all know now as a staple of old school survival horror. Alone in the Dark was the first game to successfully combine 3D graphics, adventure style puzzles, and spooky enemies to just make what we know as a survival horror game, and they did it on a floppy disk. Alone in the Dark had two direct sequels during the first half of the 90s, and then a hard reboot at the turn of the century following Infogram's sudden need to consume small companies, which spawned two so bad but not in a good way movies, but that reboot isn't canon and neither are these movies. And then, 
nothing happened for a good seven years. Then in 2008, Infograms, now going by Atari SA as the previous iteration of Atari, which was actually just Hasbro's video game division that made those awful XCOM spinoffs, got liquidated and acquired by Infograms. You see what I mean about this whole Dread Pirate Roberts thing? Atari SA decided it was time to dust off the old IP and make something new, exciting, and maybe experimental. This was still technically the same publisher and company that made Alone in the Dark, but I don't think anyone involved with the original trilogy was on board for this, like, or not directly involved. It's hard to tell as pre-2000 crediting in games was very hit or miss. Atari SA delegated making this new Alone in the Dark title to a group called Eating Games, and it was the largest team that had worked on an Alone in the Dark title ever. Eating Games released a steady drip feed of tech demos to the press, and even some promos through Machinima, which thank God for the web archive, as otherwise these promos would be lost media. Alone in the Dark dropped on PC, Xbox 360, and then had lesser versions on the PlayStation 2 and the Wii in June of 2008 to some pretty harsh reviews. However, they also re-released the game for the PlayStation 3 in December of that year, featuring a lot of bug fixes and quality of life improvements. If some of you are wondering why they just made a whole new edition of the game instead of patching it, back then, patching a game, especially big sweeping changes, wasn't a common practice yet as consoles were just barely starting to have real internet capabilities. This new PS3 version, Alone in the Dark Inferno is considered the best possible version of the game, and at least for me, it was not too hard to come by because I was willing to drive around a few used game stores and eventually someone had it. Now, while I normally don't go too hard on Patreon shilling, in fact, I think I forgot to even mention I had a Patreon in the last few videos, I am going to go a little harder here because it would not have been possible for me to bring this to you without the support of patrons. For reasons we are about to get into, this is the single most expensive video I have ever done. Support from viewers like you makes it possible for me to say, you know what? I can hunt down this 15 year old game in a physical copy in its best edition and find all the hardware I need to play and record this old game on a system that it turns out is very hard to capture. Because all of you believe in me enough to keep it going. If you're not into monthly fees, I do have that super thanks thing enabled on YouTube for one time support pledges, and I really should also remember to mention that more. So let me tell you about what I had to do to get this footage and get it into this video. So I initially got Alone in the Dark 2008 on a Steam bundle with the original trilogy, but it just doesn't run on modern PCs. You can get as far as the main menu unaltered and by fiddling around with the processor affinity settings while you're in game, you can make it to an endless loading screen if you are determined. You'll notice that this menu uses Xbox 360 prompts though, instead of keyboard prompts. And that's because this is from that dark time when PC ports were almost literal copy and paste of Xbox 360 games where no one cared about the formatting, so you often got a mess at best. In this case, however, the game just doesn't run right anymore. While there is a third-party DLL file you can download from various wikis to try to get the game working on modern OSs. However, thanks to near misses I've had in the past, I have a very strict policy about what is allowed to run on my machine, and DLL files that are from unverified sources do not pass muster. Also, I got reports from people who did try this method, and they say it doesn't work on modern OSs anyway, so it might be a very hit or miss solution. And if I'm going to go that hard, I may as well find the best version of the game. Why is this game patched by whoever owns it now, you might ask? You know, like how Star Wars Empire at War or Arx Fatalis, both games near on 20 years old now, have been supported? Well, my best guess is that there is literally no way to do that. You see, about three years after Alone in the Dark 2008 launched, the developer, Eden Games, had to lay off the majority of their staff, which caused the remaining staff to go on strike in a battle that climaxed in the studio having to go into liquidation at the beginning of 2013. The talent, or even the very computers that had the master files that Alone in the Dark 2008 was built on, might be gone forever if part of that liquidation ended up being forced to sell old development workstations. More on Eden Games later, though. 
I wasn't gonna let this slow me down though, and I decided it was high time I got a console capture card because I had a PS3 anyway, in fact it's my old PS3 from when I was in high school. I found one that suited my needs, primarily being able to record footage onto an onboard SD card since my PlayStation's in the living room far away from my office and I don't want to go buy 50 foot HDMI cables. Then I picked up the Alone in the Dark Inferno edition because if I'm gonna console capture, I'm going to console capture the best version of the game. And then things got complicated. So it turns out that the capture card needed its own external power, which uh, is fine, it came with a cable to do that, but my uh, surge protector connected to my TV did not support USB outlets. On top of that, I needed to go get a new set of HDMI cables to run this thing through the PlayStation into the TV. So I go out to the big box store and uh, get some cables and stuff that is surprisingly expensive for what I was getting. Then I had to go back out to the specialty game store and get a refurbished PlayStation 3 controllers because mine just didn't work anymore after 15 years of abuse. And just because nothing can ever be straightforward, for some reason, the capture card does not notice my PS3. I tested the card to see if it was just effective by using it on my Switch with the little Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, as some of you are still asking me about that game, and it worked perfectly fine. Hey, a uh, quick addendum here. I'm sure you have noticed by now that this is not footage of Tears of the Kingdom. I have recently been made aware that there's been a spike in Nintendo copyright claims on YouTube, and while I am not nearly in the target for what Nintendo is currently enforcing in their policies, and we could be here all day arguing about the merits of those policies or if they should have them at all, out of an abundance of caution and solidarity with the creators that just had their videos basically blocked everywhere, I will not be showing any Tears of the Kingdom footage or Nintendo footage in this video. It's also frankly because I don't want to get my video sent to algorithm hell after a re-upload just because some whoever does these claims couldn't be bothered to watch a feature length video to see like oh is this it is this like something we need to be enforcing I'd rather not risk the false positive at all even if the risk is like minuscule to make it up to y'all I have an abundance of extra cat clips that I need to burn through because I actually just got a new phone recently, meaning that the cat clips are going to be of much higher quality. By the way, patrons, the cat clips will no longer be 4K. They'll be 4K HDR. Does that sound like a fair trade to everyone? Uh, sorry about the inconvenience. Just if this was a smaller project, I might be willing to risk it. But look at the length of this video. Like, geez, I'm not going to risk the whole video getting slammed over like a cumulative two minutes of footage. As I learned, it just turns out that the PS3 has some weird pseudo HDMI output that modern capture and pass-through systems don't recognize. So I had to go out and find an active analog to HDMI pass-through, which, uh, yeah, those got discontinued a while ago. Lucky for me, after prowling the secondhand market, I found one plus an analog cable output for my PS3. So now I can force my PS3 to run an analog output, run it through an active pass-through to convert that analog output to HDMI, and then the capture card will recognize it. So I learn how to force my PS3 into allowing me to manually select outputs, plug everything in with the now massive mess of cables behind my TV, and everything works! Thank goodness for this old tutorial on YouTube with less than 500 views on it, because that was literally the only demonstration of how to do this I could find. There were a couple of Reddit posts saying that this was the thing I needed to do, but this one video is the only thing showing me how exactly to do it. But of course, this wasn't the end of it. For some reason, when I booted the game, it defaulted to the resolution passed down by God himself, which isn't very good for YouTube or being able to move around properly because I'm pretty sure this version of 480 is just cropping my peripheral vision. Turns out that Alone in the Dark only runs at 720p, which isn't all that uncommon for PS3 games, with 1080 being more of an exception than the norm for that console. Back I go into display settings, resetting everything again, and this time adding 720p as a supported resolution, and whammo! widescreen. But that wasn't the end of it either, as it turns out this old capture card I got only outputs to .mov files, which Adobe Premiere just doesn't like for some reason. So after playing the entire game, which includes me setting a timer on my watch to go off every 15 minutes because the card doesn't automatically split recordings, meaning that I have to get up, turn the thing off, and turn it back on every time I want to split a file, I export everything onto my computer, and then I spend an entire day re-encoding all the files to MP4, and now I can edit this. And with that, 
I now have Alone in the Dark 2008 to show you in its finest form. Also, if you notice a lot of screen tearing and weird graphical glitches like purple lines and whatnot, that's not your computer. It seems to be the game itself as far as I can tell. The Tears of the Kingdom footage I recorded to test the capture card didn't have any issues at all, and just for due diligence, I recorded another game on my PS3 as a point of reference to see if it was the hardware or the game. And the only common issue I had was this sort of VHS effect thingy that you sometimes see, which I think is just a byproduct of analog output. But other than that, no issues. I think it's most likely not a hardware issue because while my PS3 might be older than some of the viewers here, I've tried to take good care of it over the years because this is also my Blu-ray player. I also went back and looked at the 480p footage I accidentally recorded the first couple sessions and that was perfectly fine. So I think this might be an issue with Alone in the Dark having a hard time running in HD on the PS3. We'll get more into that later, but based on the fact that I didn't have any of these issues running the game at 480p or running Skyrim, at 720p, I think it's the game itself and not even like a defect of the disc. Speaking of Skyrim, this right here what you're seeing is literally the only copy of Skyrim I have ever purchased. I bought it back on launch day when I was still in high school and never felt the need to buy it again. Take that Todd, I am now not part of the problem. Based on my receipts, I have now spent just over $400 to properly play and capture a single game for you. That's right, 400 freedom bucks to play one PS3 game. With that kind of money, I could have bought a PS5 and still only played one game that's from the previous console generation. But now we can take a long, hard look at Alone in the Dark 2008 in its best possible iteration. I did this all for you. Patreon.com slash charlatan wonder. And with all that finally out of the way, welcome to Alone in the Dark Inferno. Everything is bad. I'll give you a forewarning now, a lot of this stuff might feel all over the place, and that's more the game itself, even though I took pains to like rewrite and reorganize the script a few times. We gotta start somewhere though, so let's go over combat. You can't really avoid combat, and while you do have options, none of them are particularly good. Another benefit I got out of firing up the old copy of Skyrim was that it allowed me to double check my input latency since while they're both powered, I do have my controller inputs being ran through two pass-throughs to get from my controller to the screen. If there's any lag, it's too small to notice on the PS3 menu or while playing Skyrim. You know, just to do some extra due diligence, I had to basically sit in my living room all day waiting for a package I need to sign for. So I decided to fire up the PS3 and just play a bunch of different games that I had to like just eliminate all other potential factors. I played half a dozen other games counting this Skyrim footage and everything else here. And I can say for one, it is definitely Alone in the Dark 2008's problem that we're getting these screen tears and weird graphical glitches because none of the other games, of which some are contemporaries to Alone in the Dark, some came before, some came after it, none of them have this problem at all. I double checked the disc and the disc seems to be perfectly fine. I looked through like all my video settings and the physical connections on the capture card and everything was fine there. And now I can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that in all likelihood, these problems are strictly on Alone in the Dark 2008's PS3 port. Now to zero in on like the dead zones or the jerky movement in shooting in particular, I've also been able to zero that into Alone in the Dark's problem as I played all those other games, none of them had problems with input lag or dead zone. I made it a point to play like two third person action games, two first person shooters, Skyrim, which is a little of everything, and then Demon Souls, since I did mention a Souls game in the script so far. So between the third person action games, which by the way, Dead Space looks really good for a PS3 game, like credit to the devs, they made it work. Neither of them had any problems with me handling the character. And then we can look here at the first person shooter games, which I made sure to pick one from a little before and a little after Alone in the Dark. And you can see here that it's much easier to shoot. Well, yes, I'm having a hard time since it's been a while since I've used a thumbstick. If you look closely at this fear footage here, you can see that it's giving you a little aim assist. Like it's just something that 
that pretty much all console based shooters have because you just don't have the same level of control with a thumbstick as with a mouse and keyboard because thumbsticks kind of need a dead zone or else like the force of you breathing on the controller will be enough to have your character start moving in another direction. And then just because I had it, Bioshock 2 right here, no problems aiming whatsoever beyond like my own skill issues. Based on all of this, as far as I can tell, which I have been exhaustively thorough for your guys' sake, there is nothing wrong with my capture card, there is nothing wrong with my PlayStation 3, there is nothing wrong with my controller or the latency between inputs, Alone in the Dark 2008 just isn't very well made. I can't think of any other way to put it. Like, I don't want to be just a big fat meanie pants towards this game, but I really, I have eliminated all other possible options to give this game excuses. Like I literally spent an entire goddamn day just sitting in front of my PlayStation playing game after game to make sure that this was not something to do with another part of the chain of this recording. Alone in the Dark's controls are just wonky no matter how you're using them and it makes combat a nightmare. Alone in the Dark 2008 features both first and third person camera controls and neither of them work very well. First person feels like it has a very limited field of view which makes it hard to fully see some of the puzzles you gotta do and repositioning the camera is jerky. Not to mention that a lot of actions like throwing things or using melee weapons cannot be done in first person. Third person isn't much better where now instead of the camera, Edward Carnby moves all jerky like. And yes, that is the same Edward Carnby from the first three games, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Carnby controls so poorly that sometimes it's the better option to just try and do platforming segments in first person where you seem to have better air control, but they'll force you to do certain things in third person by requiring held items, which aside from certain items with dual functions, you automatically drop any melee items when going into first person. To contrast third person with first, you can't use your gun or aim the flashlight in third person, except one very specific situation. Okay, we've gone over first and third person, which is effectively ranged versus melee. Let's start with how melee combat handles. Melee comes in two flavors, long items that are clearly intended for swinging around and large bulky items that Carnby sort of just awkwardly shoves at the baddies. I think the latter are more meant for breaking down doors though, but have some combat functionality. The former is done in the most awkward way possible, with you needing to use the left thumbstick to move towards the thing you want to hurt, hold the L button to lock onto the enemy, and also ready your weapon, which the tooltips say automatically focuses on the most dangerous threat, but I often found it just locks you into whatever direction Carnby is facing, which is not from the camera's perspective. And then, provided you're now facing the right direction to fight someone, wildly flailing the right thumbstick back and forth to create the motion of swinging whatever object you are holding. I have never been more thankful for the Soulsborne lock-on system than immediately after doing any melee combat in Alone in the Dark 2008. The swinging motion is awkward enough as it is, and you'll frequently whiff blows through some combination of not holding the opposite direction of where you want to swing long enough, and thus not preparing the attack properly, or just straight up missing because enemies will jump around to dodge your attack, or you're thinking, Jesus Christ, this could have been a single button press, which would have worked too, since some of the buttons just aren't used very well in the third person mode, or do really stupid things that are extremely situational, like dumping out your equipped alcohol container. You know, personally, I would have rather have it where like I hold L1 and then press a button to start dumping out my container instead of like having a series of button presses to melee. Because you know what? I want to melee quickly and with wild abandon when enemies are coming at me. I want to carefully set everything in place when I am trying to create a trail of flammable liquid to do some sort of thing. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Now for the first person combat, much like melee combat before it, they have somehow managed to make it both overly complicated and clunky despite being a very simple thing to do. Also, just to cover my bases, this isn't an older game that uses an antiquated control scheme I'm not used to, levels of clunky. This is a, why the hell were you doing like this? This makes no sense. None of your contemporaries did it like this and no one after you tried to adopt it either. Clunky. You press R2 to raise or lower your pistol and then press R1 to fire. 
That sounds pretty simple, I hear you say, but that's just a surface on it. The real hell comes from the handling. If I had to guess, the root issue might be in a pretty intense dead zone on the thumbstick for this game, which is gonna cause some other problems for us later, but it's the same issue as having a hard time making the camera move smoothly while you're in the first person, and it carries over to shooting. It is a nightmare to try and aim your gun in this game, with me eventually figuring out that it's easier to just sort of strafe until the monster just gets into your sights and then fire instead of aiming. There's no aim assist in this game, at least for the humanoid enemies that you'd want to use it on, and that, paired with the jerky aiming controls, makes taking on any more than a single enemy in first person a nightmare. Also, I cannot say this for certain, but especially after reviewing my footage and scrutinizing the gunplay, it almost looks like the humanoid monsters are reading inputs, as some of their dodges are just a little too well timed. About that aim assist thing though, it doesn't seem to work on humanoid enemies, you know, the main thing you're going to be want to rapidly acquiring targets and using your bullets on, but for everything else, such as these little bug things that go down in a single shot, destructible pieces of the environment that you will need to shoot in order to solve puzzles, you know, things that either don't move at all or that you don't want to waste bullets on, and throwing items will have auto aim set up for them. Now, I'd say that I wouldn't want to waste bullets on these small, easily killed enemies, except for as hard as I tried, it seems that you're just not able to properly attack these things with melee weapons, and the concept of stomping on a bug is entirely alien to Carmi. As for shooting uh, semantics, you start with what is called a 9mm pistol, and later will upgrade to a 45, but don't worry, Alone in the Dark uses universal ammo for these, and as far as I can tell, the only meaningful difference between the two is how many bullets each can hold. And none of this matters anyway, because conventional bullets and most melee options are useless. Effectively useless anyway. That's right, everything I told you up until this point is fundamentals and trivial at best and will not kill monsters meaningfully. Because Alone in the Dark 2008 wants to be all the survival horror games at once, humanoid monsters will not actually die until they are burnt. If you knock them down without fire, they'll be down for one to two minutes before getting back up like nothing happened. There are several ways to effectively kill monsters, which I'm going to list from the worst way to the best. By far the worst way to deal with enemies after they're being down is to drag their bodies across the room to the nearest fire source and awkwardly toss them in. This will often be a last resort that you'll find yourself doing like when you have no other option. It's slow as hell and effectively impossible to do if there's more than three downed enemies because by the time you're halfway done dragging one across the room, the others have gotten back up. It's also a pain in the ass because you cannot move laterally or pivot while dragging a body. And because of that, there is a non-zero chance Carmi will accidentally waddle right into the fire you're trying to get rid of the monster in and just die. It happened to me two or three times despite my best efforts. The next thing you can do is grab one of the flammable melee weapons and use it to whack a monster to death while it's on fire. Doing fire damage in the process is something that just needs to happen for a monster to die. And as far as I can tell, the only requirement is that fire damage happens after the KO threshold, which includes taking fire damage from a knockdown blow. The catch here is that weapons have generally low durability because fuck you, it's Breath of the Wild here too, and on top of having to awkwardly finagle your weapon over an open flame source to make it catch fire, which will put you in harm's way in more ways for, and for more time than you would like, you get maybe 30 seconds at most of burning weapon before the durability drops to zero and you just drop it. Uh, tangent here, because I've mentioned it now twice, I know some of you Nintendo guys have really wanted me to do a video on Tears of the Kingdom and if it's immersive sim or not, and I've kind of got bad news for you. I bounced off Tears of the Kingdom pretty hard only after about six hours. It just felt like almost the exact same game I played back in 2017, which while I did enjoy and get a good 60 hours out of through my initial playthrough, I couldn't be bothered to finish the game because of story didn't feel worth completing, and then at the same time I didn't want to start over and grind another 50 hours or so on a new file because what I did play while was fun didn't really feel like something I wanted to do a second time. Then you take all of that and Tears of the Kingdom feeling like Breath of the Wild version 1.1 with uh or maybe like an old school expansion pass and the main difference is I now have a neutered version of the prop gun from Gary's mod. There are a lot of games I want to play this year and I don't want to blow dozens of hours on playing the game alone alone to just play something similar to what I've played six years ago and had my fill of. Okay, where were we? Right, killing dudes. 
After lighting your melee weapon on fire, using incendiary pistol rounds is the best choice in generally what you're going to be doing. How do you get incendiary ammunition for your pistol? You go into your inventory and combine an alcohol source with your gun, and it plays a little animation of pouring a bottle of booze all over your bullets, and now you shoot fire. I don't know too much about guns, but I don't think this is how it works. Incendiary rounds can be as good as it gets since now your bullets will do some real damage and when the monsters go down, they just die. What's even better is once you pick up a lighter about a third of the way through the game, you can use an aerosol spray source like a health kit or rust remover to make a makeshift flamethrower, which while will only work very close to enemies who will instinctively run away from you when you, they see that you have fire, which is another thing that makes using flaming melee a horrible time, this pretty much insta-kills most monsters. But be careful as your health spray is considered a fuel source for this, and unless you specifically designate which aerosol you want to use in the inventory, it'll default to the nearest one in your jacket, which will often be your health spray. This can also happen when you expend one fuel source, where Carmby will just automatically grab the next one available, which again can accidentally burn through your first aid in the most literal sense. Finally, the best, albeit most resource intensive way to deal with monsters is to exploit the throwable system in game by throwing plain old bottles of alcohol into groups of enemies, which initiates a slow-mo effect and then shooting the bottle while its arc is closest to the monsters. Remember how I said that shooting thrown items has auto-aim? Yup, you don't even actually have to aim for this. The bottle will just go along a fixed arc and you press the fire button to instantly and perfectly shoot it without having to aim it at all and the bottle will instantly detonate. This will instantly kill three or four monsters if you can get them like close enough together, but during certain points of the game, you're gonna only wanna do this when there's no other option. You can also tape a box of bullets to the firebomb to make it more explodey, but this is absolutely not worth it as it takes up a third of your max ammo pool and the plain bottle kills them just as well. You're gonna be using the bottle method a lot for bosses. All right, we made it out of combat. Now we have to deal with the inventory management and crafting. As an asterisk here, Alone in the Dark 2008's crafting system was implemented well before obligatory crafting systems were a thing. That doesn't make it any less frustrating though. There's a way around it that we'll talk about because if you're psychotic enough to play this game yourself, you should be armed with knowledge. But crafting is an absolutely mandatory thing and while there are no rare ingredients to go spend dozens of hours wandering around the map looking for, you instead have a very limited inventory and that only gets worse as you collect key items or tools that you will need which share the same inventory slots as bandages or all that double-sided tape you're going to need. Now I know this is normally fine and the standard for survival horror games, but those usually also have storage boxes so that I can put the decoder ring away when I'm not using it. A lot of fuss was made to me about being able to do stuff like using a screwdriver or knife to puncture a car's gas tank and create an impromptu hazard trap, which we'll get into car stuff later. But I ended up never doing that because I could not spare the inventory slot to keep a screwdriver on my person when I also needed to keep the lighter, which is far more utility, a spoiler key item on me, and other essential crafting items like bandages, tape, or racks. I guess this is a good time as any to explain how the inventory works. Despite having no memory of any Thing, Carnby is extremely well prepared for the situation at hand with some sort of tactical harness on for his pistol that he just finds and a flashlight plus a bunch of loops on the interior of his jacket for carrying small objects. The left side of your jacket has smaller pockets for small things like bandages and tape while the right side has four slots in it for the everything else. Alcohol sources, aerosol sprays including your health kits, bottled water, empty bottles because even if you expend the contents of a bottle it does not automatically drop, glow sticks, and bags of blood. I was never able to figure out what the bags of blood were for. Now you might have noticed that there are a lot of different things that go onto the right side of the jacket that only has four slots. Yeah, it's cute that we've got this realistic inventory screen, and yes, it is a staple of survival horror to have a limited inventory. However, in practice, Alone in the Dark is all over the place with this gameplay, and for a good portion of the game, it acts like an open world action exploration game down to enemies that will respawn the second you leave the section of the map they're on, like they're roaming mobs, meaning if you accidentally need to return to an area, you have to take all that painstaking time to kill those tough monsters all over again with the same limited inventory. This is not ideal in the slightest, and when you've got monsters that get back up unless you take extra steps to permanently kill them, it requires you have certain consumables on you at all times. You're gonna find that 
dropping stuff and picking up other things laying around is just what you have to do. And there are a few seemingly band-aid fixes that show that at least on some level, there was awareness that this inventory system, while looking cool and a cool idea, was in no way right for the kind of game this is. And then there's crafting. You are going to need to do a lot of crafting, as many puzzles will require crafted items. And like we mentioned earlier, the gun is next to useless unless you pour alcohol on the bullets, meaning you have to craft incendiary rounds. Crafting is done in the inventory where you'll select a thing, awkwardly maneuver over to the thing you want to combine it with, and then mash them together. It's awkward, as the movement issues I talked about earlier here persist, and you'll often find yourself moving over the wrong thing. This happens with healing a lot too, to the point that it's more efficient to heal a section of your body, menu out, and then menu back into healing to get fully healed, as, like, if you try to use the thumbstick to move to other parts of your body to spray and heal, eh, sometimes it just pulls you out of the healing menu anyway. Also, what the hell is this spray? Like, what, 5% Silvadine solution? Jeez, I don't think we want to be using this much of this stuff, or just to have it laying around in unlocked medical cabinets in public spaces. But back to crafting. You can only craft two things together at a time, and some items will require three or even potentially four items to make, like if you want to try making a Molotov with extra explosive punch. It's also tedious, and you need to recraft certain things every time you want to use them, with the most annoying example being having to manually go back into the inventory and adding the alcohol to the bullets in my gun every time I reload, which I kept asking, why can't I just do this to a whole box of bullets? Which would really help to not have the combat get awkwardly paused every 20 seconds or so because I needed to reload and make my bullets useful. Thankfully, there is a workaround to all of this. Because it's real tedious to manually equip things in this game, there is a quick select menu, which allows you to have four left hand and right hand item combinations on the quick select. If you assigned a crafted item, such as a gun that is shooting incendiary rounds, or a Molotov, to one of these quick select slots, it won't matter if you've actually crafted these things in your inventory or not. So long as you have all the ingredients in your inventory, it will automatically and instantaneously craft the thing you need for that quick select when you select it. This is a huge game changer and I wish I had discovered it earlier because it really does make the game flow that much better. It doesn't matter if it's an item with more than two ingredients either, which is great, especially when you consider that certain puzzles will require crafted items with more than two ingredients and a lot of trial and error. Alone in the Dark straddles being a linear adventure game for about two thirds of the time and using Central Park as an open world with not a whole lot to do in it aside from driving to objectives and completing them for the last third. Along the way, you're going to need to manage your inventory, which you've already gone over, and keep yourself alive. That Silvadine spray, or whatever the heck this stuff is in the first aid spray cans, is plentiful enough, with there being times I had three whole things of it in my jacket, since they also double as flamethrower fuel, but uh, there are other kinds of injuries that the spray won't fix. As you escape the crumbling building that serves as a tutorial and get into Central Park proper, you will automatically get afflicted with a severe wound, which you will need to manually bandage. It's all scary at first with a timer until you bleed out and you leave a trail of blood everywhere you go, but I never think it took me more than like a minute or two to find like a bandage to patch myself up. That is if I didn't have a bandage already handy. And I think this only happened like twice the rest of the game, like just, just naturally occurring. I have no idea what triggers it either, since on top of this system and the superficial wounds that can be like spray healed, which as far as I can tell, all those seem to do is make you take a movement penalty if you get too many of them, there is also taking enough damage to where everything suddenly goes black and white, which heavily implies that there is also a regenerating health system on top of the superficial wounds and bleed out, because eventually this black and white effect wears off and you can take more hits. I think that's like maybe three different health systems all on top of each other that seem to contradict each other at best and outright conflict between needing to bandage potentially mortal wounds, but also having a regenerating health system that re like means... Just, just give me a minute here. I proofread this a couple times to make sure it was easy for me to read aloud, but just the mental exercise of going through the mess that is this game can be a bit much at times. Like I'm looking at it now in unedited, we are over 20 minutes of me talking, just trying to explain the gameplay. And there's actually kind of two gameplay segments I've got here. 
Bandages are also insanely plentiful, and since they can double as rags for making molotovs, you're never short-handed on them since you're always going to be stocking up once you realize you don't need to scavenge for rags or set aside an inventory slot for them. Also, I'm just going to mention that all of this is based on a default difficulty, which is the only difficulty as far as I know. I am not able to circumvent all this stuff because I'm secretly playing the game on an easier than intended setting. I'm circumventing all this stuff because the game is extremely unbalanced. Now I may as well talk about this directly because we've talked about it in every other section indirectly so far. This game has a lot of jank. It's safe to assume that every last facet of Alone in the Dark 2008 is janky and that the things that run smoothly or as intended are the exception, not the rule. Despite running this on a console where there aren't any background processes that could be running or hardware compatibility issues like you might have had on a PC which muddy things up, I am on the PS3, which is also the definitive version of this game and a closed off system. I am also using an external capture card, so that's not interfering with the game running either. With that being said, I had a couple hard crashes that forced me to hold the power button to hard reset my console and a soft lock here and there, which come to think of it, in the literal 15 year period I have owned this PlayStation, this is the first time that has happened. The next closest thing I had was back in the day when Skyrim first launched and I started to get that 100 hour glitch where things started to lag real bad and had to delete my original saves, which ironically the game got patched a week after I did that. Then we come to the game itself, and while yes, there are quite a few noticeable things we've already talked about, there's a ton of little things everywhere you look. Prompts sometimes take a few tries to get going, or some, like, position finagling to get working. Sometimes the game just straight up forgets to add lighting to the interior of vehicles. And later on in the game, a lot of puzzle triggers just won't work the first few times around. It doesn't help things that there are times where you need to be pressing three buttons at once, which I think would make this a great candidate for a PC version. But then you remember that the PC version is presently inoperable on modern hardware. And even if it was, it's a blatant copy and paste of the Xbox version of the game, and we've dealt with those before. We're lucky if all the button prompts make it onto the PC version during that dark time of console ports. This is especially disappointing, and not just for the obvious reasons, but for something we'll talk about later on. For now, I have a bigger question to ask about this game. What is this game even trying to be? It's too action-y to be a survival horror title, the controls are too awkward to be a proper action game, and there are enough weird little quirks and things you can do that convince some people who also think Fallout New Vegas is an immersive sim that Alone in the Dark 2008 might be an immersive sim too, but the short answer on that is N-O. Even the game's plot and core gameplay have the same indecisiveness about what it's trying to be, like the back and forth between being an open world adventure and a linear survival. And I can tell you that it is absolutely not in the style of a Legend of Zelda game, because in those games, there's reasons to explore the overworld. And the points of interest are well fleshed out, and the dungeons will give you key items that will let you progress in other places, leading to that sense of adventure that gives you a reason to explore a world. Alone in the Dark has none of that. Alone in the Dark has an identity crisis. The best, although kind of mean way I can summarize Alone in the Dark 2008's feel is that it's we have Uncharted at home. Drake's fortune had dropped about a year before the first iteration of Alone in the Dark 2008 came out, and at times it's obvious how much of an influence that game might have had on Alone in the Dark. There's a lot of puzzle solving, which admittedly this is based on a series of games that while they were the original survival horror, were still adventure games at heart. There is a lot of climbing ropes in precarious situations with stuff falling on you and shimmying along ledges that honestly feels out of place. And overall, Alone in the Dark seems to be desperately trying to have that interactive action movie feel that Uncharted wrote the book on, but it fails miserably. It's got lots of set pieces, but instead of being excited for them, I just groan because the game does not control nearly well enough for them to be fun. I died more times than I'd like to admit because the man who I swear I will explain how this is Edward Carnby from the original game won't jump off of rope quite right, or sometimes how the spooky black goop will just insta-kill you even if you're not actually standing in it, because fuck you, reload your save, that's why. If there was one place I can see this a lot, it is the driving segments. There aren't too many of these, it's mainly towards the beginning and end of the game, and then you kind of have like an open world one towards the middle, but you will be doing a lot of just driving in general to get around once the game decides it's time to be an open world adventure. There's only one speed when you're walking on foot, and it is slow. That's not what we're concerned about right now though. 
However, what is concerning is that according to the game's sound, Carmi doesn't know how to shift gears in a car. What we're concerned about right now directly though, are these big set piece chase sequences. This is mostly because the cars handle like ass for one, and a lot of what you'll be doing in these driving segments will boil down to just memorizing the callouts and where the obstacles are going to appear, especially in the first one. And you can effectively not make a single mistake or the earthquake that is conveniently following directly behind you will just swallow you right up. Also, remember that little theory I had about dead zones being an issue with this game? It comes into play here too. On top of it just being a pain to quickly and precisely move for the cars while you're driving them, there's one other major major problem with how the cars handle. You see, because as far as I can tell, there's no way to get a monster off your car once it Princess Peach hovers across the map to jump on your roof, they put in a feature where if you rapidly yank the left thumbstick to the left, Carnby will open the door and bail out of a car. This is actually really handy since you can't seem to brake check the monsters off the top of your car, you can't shoot them from like underneath, and you can't like drive past a low hanging branch or something to get them off, you just have to sit there and take it. The problem comes from how this feature does not get disabled during chase sequences. You know, the chase sequences where you'll be needing to make sudden harsh turns or drive really fast on a timer, you know, like stuff like that. I had to restart most of these chase sequences in Central Park several times over because I'd keep having to like turn hard to the left to avoid something and Carnby would just instantly bail out of the car, causing me to game over. This is speculation here, but I almost think this might have been an abandoned six axis feature that got remapped to the thumbstick. Hear me out now, Sony really, really wanted to show the gaming public that they could do motion controls just like the Wii could, practicality be damned. A lot of early PS3 titles from the first couple years of the console's life cycle had these integrated, and as advertised, these were a way to maneuver a character or do some sort of action without needing to press an extra button by physically moving the controller. In practice, it meant you'd like adjust your way you're sitting or something, and the resulting controller movement would launch your character into a dive or something. I've theorized that this might be an abandoned six axis implementation because nowhere in the game do the tool tips prompt you to physically move the controller and after checking a couple different databases that list like all the six axis supported games I did not see alone in the dark there. However, the act of quickly yanking a controller to the left to bail out of a car would fit perfectly with what the six axis was meant to do and fits much better for driving as that would eliminate the exact problem I was having during the chase sequences. And the timing was about right for game companies to still be taking the six axis series Seriously, as Alone in the Dark's contemporaries like Metal Gear Solid 4, Tomb Raider Underworld, and Call of Duty all supported it. Maybe they just couldn't get it working right and were forced to reassign the bailout function to the left thumbstick. I don't know. I am entirely theorizing on this with no hard evidence to back anything up. It just kind of feels like that. Also, you'll need to play a minigame to hotwire most cars, but luckily, the answer is always the same between similar car types. And also, similar car types will always have the exact same thing inside the glove box, meaning you you can just run around from taxi cab to taxi cab and have a full inventory of health spray whenever you need it. On the note of operating vehicles, there's a segment of this game that utterly baffles me. The forklift arc. At about the middle point of the game, it turns out there are secret catacombs beneath the museum in Central Park, and now Carnby must take on the extremely dangerous task of operating a forklift without any sort of license or certification. Shame on him for not only endangering himself with this stun, but risking the lives of everyone around him. On one hand, it's very strange that, from the outside, in the middle of fighting actual demons in Central Park, we have to stop to do forklift puzzles, but when you look at Alone in the Dark in its entirety, it's full of stuff that's just only ever used once and we never hear of it again. Other examples include the act of not just needing to hotwire, but break into a car, and using your phone to call someone. The segment took me a little over 20 minutes to get through the whole thing, but it only took that long because one of my soft locks was here when I got stuck shimmying on the edge of a box that I had just stacked. If that hadn't have happened, this whole thing would have taken me less than 15 minutes to do. They made an entire working forklift with mechanics that aren't seen anywhere else in the game for less than 15 minutes of gameplay. It's essentially a bunch of lever puzzles and then some literal box stacking, which hold your horses, we will get to that later. This is also around the point that I discovered another mechanic that makes very little sense. 
there is a built-in level skip feature. At first, I thought you were just able to see previews of future segments if you wanted to spoil yourself on the plot for some reason, but it turns out that thanks to this recap system, you can not only go backwards to restart certain points of the game, but you can also go forwards and straight up skip the majority of the game if you really wanted to. I also found out that if you use this level skip system in lieu of loading the game, it pistol starts you. You lose any non-essential items you are holding onto, including ammo and resources you will need to complete puzzles. Don't use level skip. When you aren't doing puzzles with a forklift, you're doing puzzles. Puzzles in an Alone in the Dark game are to be expected. Puzzles are about what you'd expect them to be in a game that really wants to be uncharted but spooky. They'll usually involve interacting with something or moving something, and then you're on your merry way. Something I take issue with is that the game assumes the player has zero intelligence. You'll know when you're about to do a puzzle, because as soon as you walk into a room, the camera will cut away to the focal point of the puzzle and then show you several shots of exactly where you need to go to solve the puzzle. Now, I get that there might have been some aversion to the literal pixel hunting moon logic that was adventure puzzles in the 90s, but there's a little bit of leeway between, hey, you need to examine this literal pair of pixels on the ground early in the game if you want to be able to progress two hours later, and literally telling the player exactly how to solve the puzzle through a slide show. Now, I'm fine with puzzles, even ones that insult my intelligence. I'm not fine with these insane, make a Molotov cocktail in the crafting menu, then throw it at a very specific spot at a very specific time, puzzles. You first come across these in a museum, and after trying a bunch of different things, I finally caved and checked the walkthrough to see that there was a very specific answer to this puzzle. And then later on, I found I'd be doing this a lot. You are presented with a scene where one of the bug nest thingies is blocking a security laser that is preventing the grating from being raised. There is a non-hostile bug that keeps running out of the nest to run through a crawl space in the side of the grate and feed on a bottle of blood that's on your side. Then after a few seconds, it runs back to the nest. No matter how many times you attack and kill this bug, it will always respawn and never be hostile. Can I try to carefully bank a firebomb through the hole that the bug is going through to hit the nest like the last puzzle where I threw the firebomb through a small hole? No. Can I pour out alcohol onto the bug while it eats to create a trail of fuel that will light on fire and ignite the nest? No. Can I just tape the bottle onto the bug and have it create a fuel trail that way? No. Can I just shoot the stupid nest through the grating as it's clear the barrel of this pistol could easily fit through the holes in this grate? Of course not. The solution, which is the only solution that you will need to do this puzzle, is to make a Molotov cocktail and then craft again to wrap it in double-sided tape. And then you throw it on the bug at a very specific time so that the rag burns down, it ignites the Molotov cocktail at the exact moment the bug is close enough to the nest to set the nest on fire. You will often know that you are near a puzzle like this because there'll be an area nearby which is not only absolutely loaded with flammable liquids, tape and rags, but they're all in magic closets where every time you leave the room, they'll be fully restocked with all the crafting materials you can need when you come back, so it is impossible to lock yourself out of progression. These magic closets are highly exploitable. What's especially frustrating about these is that one, you need to be extremely mindful of the burn down time, which starts not when you throw the Molotov, but as soon as you light it in your inventory, and two, Sometimes you will also need to run and operate another thing as soon as you throw the Molotov onto its intended target. That means that you will need to light the firebomb at a very, very specific time, throw it perfectly at just the right moment in something's movement cycle to stick it, which is no easy feat because the throwing arc starts in a default trajectory no matter how you position the camera. So there is no preemptively lining up the shot before you light it. And then if the game is feeling sadistic, you have to run like hell over to the other thing you need to operate and put the thing in position to work. And you know what the best part of this is? Some of these don't even work thanks to the game's physics. Many times you will need to chuck your sticky bomb at a little bug that's climbing on a rope. But unless that rope is flush against a wall, the force of the bottle com colliding with the bug will knock that sucker right off the rope, rendering the puzzle like failed and you need to like run far away to get it to reset and then come back. Luckily, if you play it real dangerous with where you're standing on a ledge, you can still complete this particular puzzle by throwing the thing just close enough to the big old root to where when it explodes, it will set it on fire. 
The physics of this game are a recurring theme in some of these puzzles, up until the point you complete them that is. While things like I just talked about still exist in the game, the game does try to do a lot of quote unquote physics puzzles to try and give off the illusion that they're doing the thing Half-Life 2 did. What'll happen a lot of the times is that it'll show you what you need to do like always, you'll follow through with the steps, but then at the very last second, the game will go into a cutscene where the physics manipulation will happen there and the puzzle solves itself. I got stumped on quite a few of these until I realized, oh, I'm supposed to let the game do this for me. The actual physics of the game are pretty weird, with certain enemies being able to straight up no-sail a car coming at them at full speed, or how these bat things that probably only weigh a pound each are able to carry a grown woman. I didn't have any sort of mic attached to my capture card, so unfortunately, I do not have audio of me laughing hysterically at this moment because it is goofy as hell. So remember how I said that Alone in the Dark isn't sure if it wants to be a linear survival horror or an open world game? Well, I think it's time we talk about the last third of the game. At a certain point, they kind of run out of plot development just short of the actual big reveal at the game's finale and are like, oh yeah, you need to go collect a bunch of insight from the spooky root thing so you can perceive the evil secrets, which is basically going around the overworld you've been in for most of the game and using fire to take out those root things. The root things are peppered across the overworld and the challenge to burn them ranges from they're literally just sitting in a gazebo or something with maybe one bad dude hanging around that won't even see you in time to stop you to the most ridiculous Molotov timing puzzles that you also have to navigate through an underground hallway of the insta-kill goop to get to. This shit only gives you three insight out of 100 total too. I hate this particular one. You'll know when you're physically near one of these things because the game will start making funny noises and smearing Vaseline all over your screen. You'll be able to know the relative location of these things based on your map on your in-game phone, which you will have to repeatedly open to get your bearings because while there is a mini-map, there is no compass and the mini-map rotates with you. You can kind of use the waypoint marker to try and find your bearings if you know your location relative to the castle that you need to go to when you're done root hunting, but I just want a due north symbol. Like, just tell me where north is and I can do the rest. It's gonna take a while to do all these, even if you happen to grab a couple, like the set of roots that are on the way to an objective earlier in the game, where you get the Magnum. These are way spread out across the map, and most of them require you getting to an out of the way area or solving a complicated puzzle. Sometimes a puzzle is just this big knife dude in an open area hanging out by the root thing, and you have no cover to hide from their pinpoint accuracy blades. You need to collect at least 30 insight points in order to see the thing in the castle, which will unlock the final chapter of the story, revealing the secret location of a key described in the obligatory prophecy. Except no, fuck you. Once you get all the necessary insight, they make you do it all again. That's right. After you go through the trouble of clearing the map of all these things and hitting the magic number for insight, which I should try to call by its actual name, Awakening, you're given the ability to see secret symbols on the walls of the castle that you need to illuminate with your special decoder ring and flashlight, which tells you that you're still not powerful enough to do the thing. And you gotta go burn more roots that they just spawned all over the map. The map will change at this point, or at least I think it does as it populates with more spooky roots to set on fire. And I'm just gonna call it how I see it. This is some pretty blatant padding. Well, originally nearly every route had some sort of puzzle or thing you had to do to get them. The majority of the routes in the second wave are just a bunch of smaller ones that are just sitting out in the open in places where it's hard to bring a car so you have to walk to them. The map also seems to change, like at least I think it does, because I noticed as I was driving, a lot of stuff seems to be as inconvenient as possible to drive to with a lot of random barriers or cliffs or things that you can only approach from like one side of the map and it's like this long trip around the lake to get there. Like there's one that's just in the middle of this really narrow bridge that like you can't bring any sort of vehicle on that just it's smack in the middle of the lake and it's literally you just run for two minutes maybe like it takes a total of three to get to it because like there's a couple monsters you gotta kill and then you just run back like that's just okay just five minute time penalty there's no challenge once you get to the route you just set it on fire and be on your way and you have to walk all the way back across that bridge and yes you need to do the majority of these at least on other versions of the game out of the 13 hours of recorded footage I have for this game, a little under four of those hours is just running around the map hunting for roots. And now that we've done the double round wander around the map quest, I can tell you the cherry on top of all of this hell. This is the 
fixed version of Alone in the Dark. You heard me right. The PS3 version of Alone in the Dark is called Alone in the Dark Inferno and released six months after the main game, featuring a lot of major improvements from the initial releases, just like we talked about at the beginning of this video. God, how long ago was that? Among the changes that were made in those six months to address the complaints were not only zooming out the third person camera, but allowing you to move it. Because in the original version of the game, it was much too zoomed in to get a good look at your surroundings. And while the fixed camera is an homage to the original trilogy, it's a huge pain when trying to figure out puzzles that have things on multiple walls. And even more of a problem when scrounging for a weapon that got knocked out of your hands, or you know, sometimes Carmi just drops them for no reason, if you can't look around with the camera to see where it went. I looked at some footage on YouTube of the Xbox 360 version of the game, and it kind of looks like this. I think it might also be why I get graphical glitches in this game. Perhaps taking the camera this far out was a little too much for the in-game engine, which wasn't expecting to have to render this much stuff in-game or having to cull as aggressively because previously the game was on a fixed camera in a much closer third person. I don't know though. I'm not a game developer and I've tried to test as much as I can to see, okay, is this some other issue or is this actually the game? And all signs point to this being the game. Other tweaks include not having monsters attack you while you are managing your inventory, which uh, thank God. The lock on feature we talked about earlier for melee and allegedly smoother movement. Also, they remove batteries from the game, as I noticed my flashlight just always stays at 100%. So I guess, like, maybe that was an issue with, oh, you don't need to waste an inventory slot on batteries anymore. They also improved car handling, which I don't even want to think about a game with worse car handling than this. And most of all, they significantly reduced the amount of spooky points you need to get to the final area of the game from 75 down to 50 which you can theoretically get 50 if you do all the routes before entering the castle the first time and can skip the second wave of route hunting entirely. That makes a very convincing case for the route hunting acting as just pure padding and people didn't like it to the point where the devs changed it, or perhaps the open world was sort of a mandate by the higher ups and the devs just didn't have the time, resources, or ideas of what to put in that world. They also added this like chase boss fight, which is awful and I hate it. You aren't even supposed to actually fight this. You just run to the other end of the train and then hit it twice and it dies. I literally expended every flammable object attacking this dude on the way to the back of the tram thinking, oh, I have to actually whittle down its HP. And I actually, I lost that fight because, oh, now that I'm at the end, I have zero alcohol sources to throw at this thing. When I finally did cave in and look it up again, it was the most unsatisfying fight ever because it's not even a fight. It's just a big QTE. You know, it has been 27 pages of script to get to this point and we just barely covered the gameplay mechanics. As a point of reference, that's longer than the entirety of the Redfall video script. As I write this draft, it is 1 a.m. and my brain is fried and I hate everything. I'm going to go to bed real quick and we're gonna do a little cooking segment to take a break from being alone in the dark. I think for today's cooking segment, we're not gonna so much as make a single dish as we are gonna make something that can be used in a bunch of dishes we've already done before, pesto. Pesto is a fairly simple thing to make. It's just that if you wanna try and buy all the ingredients off the shelf, you're gonna be in pretty deep because it's like, what, $2 to get half a dozen leaves of basil at the grocery store, or maybe five bucks to get one of those basil plants that's just barely clinging to life. Uh, geez, yeah, don't, do this unless you're growing it yourself. This cooking segment is more of a fun thing to do for me, unless you too have been growing a lot of basil and it's somehow survived this long into the onset of colder temperatures. This is going to be my fourth and final harvest of this big guy right here, who on top of the now four batches of pesto we've done with this, has yielded oodles of garnish for other dishes, as well as being able to grow enough to support being cloned off into two other potted plants, and half a dozen cuttings for mason jar hydroponics, which I'm hoping I can get to live 
live through the winter. And all of this came from a four inch sprout I picked up for a buck 50 at the hardware store, which I also almost killed at first because I planted during fool's spring. I'm really hoping I can keep at least one of these mason jars alive until next spring so I can replant it. We're getting a little sidetracked though. What you've been seeing me do here is trim down my frankly overgrown basil plant, which has gotten so big its roots were able to support it growing sideways to get around my balcony's awning to get more sunlight. I know that I'm probably not going to get another harvest out of this big boy, but it's still best practice to cut it down to just the point above where the stems split off. We'll worry about separating leaves from the stems in a sec. For now, we just want to focus on trimming down this big boy until the larger leaves are all off it while sparing the new, smaller leaves so that they can grow out and later form new branches for bushier, higher yielding plants. Once you've got the plant cut back, remove it from the kitchen and back to its own. Now would be the time to start picking the leaves off the stems. This is nothing too special here. We're literally just plucking leaves and putting them into a bowl for washing. Once you've got all the leaves off the stem, fill a bowl with water, but don't rinse it just yet because we're going to let the basil soak for at least five minutes to help reduce any wiltiness the leaves might have, which is also a good time to start grating your Parmesan cheese. Let the leaves soak, then wash and rinse them, and finally spread them out on a wire rack with paper towels underneath to drip dry for a bit while you finish grating the Parmesan and whatever else you need to do for dinner that night. Now the final step for the basil prep is that once it's all been picked, washed, and dried, you're going to want to just run your knife through the pile of leaves a few times to break them up. We're not looking for anything uniform or particularly small here, we're just trying to make sure that the midribs, that little stemmy part in the middle of the leaf, are broken up so that when we pulverize these later on, they don't wrap around the middle of your food processor. Okay, pesto time. Pesto is a surprisingly simple thing to make. The ingredients are just basil, olive oil, pine nuts, parmesan, salt and pepper. That's it. The kicker comes from that you need a whole lot of basil to do this, and uh, pine nuts are possibly the single most expensive nut in the store. You can get around that part though by just subbing pine nuts out for raw cashews, which are half the price. Get a little food processor like the one I got here that's part of my hand blender set, or just a plain old normal blender. Fill it up with packed down basil leaves, nuts, and oil, and then pulse it until everything is ground up. Then add a little bit more oil, pulse some more, and then repeat the process until the basil nut solution becomes a thick sauce. Remember to only season with salt and pepper at the end to prevent over seasoning and taste it as you go. Now you'll notice I didn't add the Parmesan yet. That's because if you want to save your pesto for future use, you'll only want to add the cheese right as you're about to use the pesto in a recipe. In the meantime, transfer the extra pesto into an ice cube tray that will last a couple months in the freezer. We're not going to be doing that though today because I had a little oopsie and now my floor is very slippery. Good thing I had such a bountiful harvest and can keep going. So I'll admit to you all that after the first batch of pesto went kaboom on my kitchen floor, things got a little wobbly in general as my GoPro battery died and my main camera wasn't framed quite right. Regardless, we gotta do something with all this pesto. There's more obvious things like spaghetti pesto or just using it as a dip, and frankly, it's hard to go wrong here. For my applications I did tonight, which I'll admit are a bit hard to see, but luckily I took pictures on my phone, I made myself a chicken pesto pizza for dinner and then took the rest to make the mother of all pesto mozzarella sandwiches for my wife using the extra chicken breast from the pizza, the fancy mozzarella, and some thick tomato slices. I've really been trying to up my sandwich game lately as my wife's currently on clinical rotations in school, so she's got some long, hard days ahead and needs something tasty and filling to keep her strength up. For a second, I even looked into like consumer MREs or like other survival foods that just you open up and eat, but those aren't nearly as good or nutritious as fresh food, and sometimes the clinical rotations are so hectic that she won't even have time to wait for a flameless heater or even microwave something. So sandwiches are great in that regard. I also got her one of those cute little thermoses that has like a spoon compartment so I can like make her big soups and she can take portions of that when she's got like long overnights or something. Let me know what you want to try making with pesto and as always if you like this cooking segment standalone cooking videos with complete recipes are available to all five dollar and up patrons over on patreon.com slash charlatan wonder. Now let's get back to the chaos that is alone in the dark. Okay, time to tackle that big question some of you have been asking me for a while now. 
is Alone in the Dark 2008 an immersive sim? Like I said earlier, the short answer is no, but now that we're in a designated part of the video to talk about it, I can explain why and sigh as somebody inevitably comments something along the lines of, no, -uh, you're wrong, with no explanation despite typing 10 paragraphs. From the outset, the main thing I see when it comes to this kind of discussion is that many of the people who assert AITD 2008 is an immersive sim either haven't played it and have only seen clips of other people doing what seem like m simmy things, but those clips are taken out of context and don't show the full gameplay, which often amounts to, yes, you can stack the boxes, but that is not only the intended solution, but the only way to solve this problem. Or alternatively, they haven't played the game since 2010 and maybe their memory is a little rosy. Between the actual gameplay and how hard it is to get this thing going, it's just not something people regularly replay and maybe they misremember things. I, however, have freshly suffered through this. To the game's credit, there are many ways to do some tasks, but oddly enough it parallels with what I experienced with Tears of the Kingdom and saw through other people playing the game, where it seems to accidentally sometimes adopt immersive sim tenets like box stacking or fire propagation, but the story and game at large never acknowledge these methods and keeps you tightly reined in to what it wants you to do. The best way to put it is something I've said before, which is just because Chili's has steaks on its menu does not make it a steakhouse. For example, you can use fire to burn away certain obstacles, but you can only ever do it when that was the explicitly intended thing for you to do. Any light source can make the goo proceed, but you absolutely must pass through the goop using a light source, and if you try anything else, it just insta-kills you. And what's my personal least favorite is that you cannot circumvent fighting tougher enemies by trying to sneak around them, or hit them with a car, or do something creative. No, they're just gonna no-sell everything, and you're gonna have to get out of your car and get blasted by throwing knives. There is also no kitchen sink design, which is associated with immersive sims, where unorthodox outcomes can be acknowledged. For instance, in the Inferno edition, while it is entirely possible to just do all the insight root things in the first setting and not need to do it a second time, the game will never acknowledge this, and when you get to that point in the story, they just say, yeah, just go back and collect more roots, even though you don't need to actually do it. If you want an example of how it's actually done, it's entirely possible in Deus Ex Human Revolution to happenstance upon the radio tower in Derelict Row while exploring the first hub world of Detroit. You can preemptively shut down the remote access point into Sarah's network before you're even given the quest to do so, and you will get multiple messages from Pritchard, your handler, unique to doing this exact thing, and you will entirely skip that mission later on when you've already been to Derelict Row, so there's no point in going back. Or, you know, just literally any weird trick you've seen people do in Baldur's Gate 3. I really want to do the Is It an Immersive Sim video on Baldur's Gate 3, and I'm hoping that most recent 14 gigabyte patch will finally make the game run at a stable frame rate for me again, because it was fine on launch, but then the first patch just wrecked my performance. Just to hammer things home, let's try to do the one litmus test for immersive sims that works most of the time. What is and is not an immersive sim is nebulous at best, but this is the best we've got. The door test. Let's see how many ways there are to get past the door and into a room. Our player character has to get past a locked door. His options are, use a heavy object to bash the door in, shooting at the door's handle to blast it away, rendering the lock useless. Or you could just throw a bottle and shoot it right as it's about to hit the door to blow the whole thing off its hinges and maybe blast some of the baddies inside. This sounds good and even promising at first, but then you think about it and realize we've just done the same thing in three different ways. Our only option was to break down this door. I can't seem to burn doors down unless it's a plot specific thing. I can't find a carelessly written down passcode or even a poorly hidden key to open the door. There are never any alternate paths into rooms and there is never anyone you can either convince or trick into opening a door for you because there's no real friendly NPCs and monsters just sort of wait patiently for you to open the door for them before like coming at you. Like it doesn't even let you do that. So at least by this metric, Alone in the Dark is not an immersive sim by failing the door test and 
everything else I just said. I think one of the reasons why people make this mistake and mislabel Alone in the Dark 2008 as an immersive sim is that it looks like there are many ways to accomplish a task at first until you realize that you're just doing the same thing in slightly different ways. The game never acknowledges you for figuring something out before you're supposed to or circumventing a task. You're only allowed to be creative so long as you color inside the game's lines, and there isn't even a stupid hacking game that we can dump skill points into to make easier. If anything, my thesis of it really feels like the devs just ran wild with every cool idea they had and no one was around to tell them no don't start that feature yet finish the already existing mechanics and level de design that you have and then you can try to make the new thing it's further reinforced by scrutinizing that many methods of solving problems are all just the same thing but you do it a slightly different way i know this is an oversimplification and i understand that most of the time a mechanic needs to be designed along with the development of the game as a whole so that it fits well throughout the entire thing but then again, there's still the issue of Alone in the Dark just having too many half-baked features that are weird at best and outright conflicting with other mechanics or non-functional at worst. I think it might just be that also some people mistake having lots of mechanics for being an immersive sim, when immersive sims are all about fleshed out systems that can be used to think outside the box, not a bunch of gimmicky things that can only be used in very specific developer intended situations. You know, Alone in the Dark is supposed to be some sort of horror game, or at least a thriller game. Let's try to talk about them spookies. I'm gonna be blunt here and say that Alone in the Dark 2008 is more edgy than spooky, and if anything, it's peak turn-of-the-century edge. F-bombs are thrown around like it's going out of style, and everyone is in that perpetually I'm so badass state of anger, because what is a range of emotions in our cool, edgy, M-rated game? Yeah, there's spooky zombies running around and attacking you, but they aren't particularly inspired and this isn't 1995 anymore, so plain old generic zombies don't really cut it for the spooks. Like, I've been hesitant to make the comparison, but we're far enough into the video to say that this came out as the same year as Dead Space, which on that note, the death animations in this game are the lamest, most uninspired things I've seen, and when you think about how much this game likes to use its edgy, excessive swearing and the plot, which I'll get into later, I start to think that maybe instead of making so much effort into putting every half-finished idea into the game, it would have been worthwhile to drill down on the core features first, like being scary. Jeez, you don't even get a death scream if Carmi gets trash compacted. Was Carmi's new character design just too cool and edgy to scream when he's being horrifically killed by ancient traps? Make no mistake, I think Alone in the Dark intends to be horror, especially with how the game starts, but it leans so hard into that early 2000s edge for there to be any sort of scary atmosphere. I think it's just the MO for the game though. It tries to do too many things or too many conflicting things, and it ends up failing at all of them. It makes an earnest effort to set up a spooky premise early on in that building that gets destroyed, but it's too self-conscious to commit to having a vulnerable main character or even a main character that shows any vulnerability whatsoever. So everyone keeps needing to say fuck in that gravelly voice so that no one thinks we're scaredy cats. To this game's credit, there are a few moments that actually maintain a spooky atmosphere. The one that sticks out to me the most is this large building you can enter before the root hunting segment even starts, which has very good like mood lighting and even a few scares. There's also something to be said about the end game if you have a fear of Indiana Jones style death traps. I'm really, I'm trying to rack my brains here for just something genuinely scary in this game. But aside from maybe the chase scene they added like in this edition with that monster and some of the more precarious moments when you're trying to climb your way out of rapidly collapsing scenery, alone in the Dark's lack of focus hinders its ability to give you a good scare. Another underlying issue with this game's ability to give you a good spooking is that the roots of horror, not the things in game, are generally unfocused. This is allegedly coming from those fissures that are appearing which might have something to do with hell which grab people and turn them into monsters, but are these zombies? Are these demons? Are they still alive? Why are there bug things and bats? I guess hell has bats in it, apparently. However, it doesn't help the game case that there's other vaguely occult things involved, such as apparently Carnby scouring East Asia in India for occult artifacts, and last time I checked, those places aren't really associated with the Western interpretation of hell and kind of have their own hells going on, depending on regional religions. And frankly, the more I look at this stuff in post, the less I think this has anything to do with any sort of biblical or even generic hell, as a lot of these monsters just kind of don't fit. It's almost like they designed all this stuff before they knew what the plot was going to be, and when the 
plot did start shaping up, they didn't have the will or perhaps the means to go back and alter things to fit the theming of the story. It also doesn't help things that most of what I assume were at one point spooky notes left behind for you to discover are now just random text messages that the girl Sarah sends to you on your phone. Why is Sarah sending me excerpts of Theophile's diary? All right, we've conquered the gameplay, put whether this is an immersive sim or not to bed, the answer is no, and we took a moment to address the not so spookiness of Alone in the Dark 2008. Let's try to parse out the story, which hopefully will not be as convoluted as everything else here. In fact, it's fairly straightforward. Maybe that's something to do with how so much of the development resources were spent trying to throw every manageable thing into this game that they neglected their writing department. The story starts with you waking up in the custody of some sketchy robe dudes who want to use you for something, and the player character literally says he has no idea who he is as he looks into a mirror. The old guy you were captured with seems to know what's going on though. Too bad we immediately get separated. There's talk of someone being the light bringer, but we'll hold off on that for now because we need to introduce the only woman in the entire story who has to juggle being the damsel in distress, the combative at first but inevitable love interest, and the backup chosen one. If it wasn't for me labeling her name in the clips, I would have completely forgotten that this character's name is Sarah, and beyond that and her acting as a plot device, I cannot tell you a single thing about her, which isn't so much how much I forgot her, but they didn't really write anything for her. The old guy, who you eventually meet up with again, is actually your student and has spent his entire life studying ancient religions and prophecy in the local museum, named Theophile. Which is the most honest to god, late stage Harry Potter bullshit I have heard for some time now. The main antagonist is named Crowley because what else do you name your robe wearing cultist bad guys whose goals are nebulous at best? Now, I've already spoiled this for a while, like basically the whole video, but let's drop the bomb anyway. The player character is indeed Edward Carnby from the original trilogy. Yes, this dude and that dude are the same person. They overtly confirm this early in the game because after a protracted segment where you need to get to an ambulance to have a doctor check your wounds and possible excessive use of silver sulfadiazine, the doctor tries to pull your medical records and instead of seeing things he'd need to see like your blood type, medical access, allergies, pre-existing conditions, and boring stuff like that, he is instead presented with the information that you are Edward Carnby. You solved the mystery at Dorsetto Manor and saved a young girl from the clutches of bootleggers in Hell's Kitchen, which makes you well over 100 years old. Also, while the events of Alone in the Dark 3 aren't mentioned, it says that he disappeared in 1938, and it's noted that yes, he has definitely had that cool scar the whole time. Okay, time for plot spoilers. If you don't want spoilers for a 15 year old game, which I will tell you is not worth the trouble to get running, let alone playing, uh, you know what to do. So after Carnby wakes up and is taken out to what would have been his execution, a bunch of strange fishers start appearing and swallowing people whole. That's not enough for them though, because they start literally ripping apart New York City, and Carnby takes advantage of the chaos to escape his captors and look for answers. Carnby reunites with Theophile and meets Sarah as he's escaping the crumbling building, and before he can figure out what it means to be the light bringer, Theophile decides he's too slow in this form and goes to the spirit realm to assist Carnby and Sarah, but not before telling them that they need to go find room 943 in the basement of the local museum. I should mention at this point, because I can't really think of any other time to do so, that Alone in the Dark 2008 fancies itself an episodic adventure, and as you complete every major chapter of the game, it rolls credits like a TV show. The game also has a previously on Alone in the Dark recap every time you boot the game and load your save. To the game's credit, it's built for this, with each major chapter bookending at a good stopping point, and you only need to press a single button to keep going after a chapter after finishes, and you don't even have to do that because after 10 seconds it'll automatically go forward unless you quit the game. Now where were we? After dealing with Sarah getting carried away by bat things like she was a very large french fry, Carnby rescues her from her captivity, which just so happens to be in the very museum you were trying to get to anyway. Carnby fights his way through the museum and makes it to room 943 with Sarah. Suddenly that blinking mechanic that was only used at the beginning of the game and then only if the extremely inaccurate spider bug things managed to slime you uh, and you gotta blink it away, it becomes relevant again. And in order to see Theophile's hints 
from the spirit realm, you need to close your eyes. Good on you, devs. That's a great way to keep a mechanic relevant while still keeping it fresh. Carnby learns that the weird necklace he's wearing is actually the Philosopher's Stone, which means he is indeed over 100 years old now, and that he first took Theophile in when Theophile was but a child. He also learns that the Lightbringer is Lucifer, the devil, because that's what the Lightbringer translates to according to the game, and I double checked this. I think this is more of uh, Google Translate's misstep here for a literal translation, as further Wikipediaing also says that Lucifer does mean Lightbringer, and also in Roman folklore was Venus, the morning star. It seems that Lucifer has meant a lot of things over the millennia. It turns out that by this game's logic, this is the biblical Lucifer, and when God cast him out of heaven, he did not fall down into the pit later to be known as hell, but instead remained on earth, cursed to be a mortal. Lucifer found his way through this by creating the Philosopher's Stone and using it as a vessel for his soul so that he could return when the time is right. Mortal men could possess the stone, and in exchange for being under his influence, Lucifer would let them live indefinitely so they might carry out his plans. At some point though, someone figured out what was going on and broke the Philosopher's Stone in half, effectively crippling Lucifer's ability to fully bring about his plans, but still somewhat able to exert his control over those who possessed halves of the stone. Also, even with half a stone, you're still full of mortal. Carnby has been assumedly in possession of half the Philosopher's Stone since at least 1938, possibly working with Crowley at L, as it's frequently alluded to that just because Carnby got his memory erased does not mean he is absolved of all the things he's did which possibly means that the literal hell breaking loose right now was directly Carnby's fault. Also, they just add in one of the diary entries that Sarah text messages to you that it's implied the Philosopher's Stone will make you change your appearance because how else are we going to explain Carnby's edgy new look that's different from both the original look he had and the, the new nightmare look? There's a sort of prophecy involving quote unquote the key and since we've got no other leads we're going to follow that prophecy by collecting up all the insight to reveal the key's secret location and then using the key for whatever it does after getting enough spooky points to reveal the location and then getting more spooky points to surpass the barrier we arrive how do we surpass the barrier well the spooky power gives us enough energy to chuck a molotov cocktail over the top like it was a fence or something like, really, game? You're gonna make me do all this stuff to gain power to, like, overcome the barrier, and in the end, I just gotta chuck something over the top of it? I think I could have done that without amassing large amounts of insight from the literal roots of evil. So we finally get to the end. We delve into the secret fortress beneath Central Park and make it through all the insane puzzle death traps and find the key. The key is an old dude who's been holding on to the other half of the Philosopher's Stone for literally God knows how long. Personally, I think that it's the last person in the world we should be getting close to right now, and if anything, one of us should be launched into space to keep the halves of the stone as far apart as possible. But nah, we're just gonna give this guy uh, a ride through Central Park to go back to the museum. In fact, we're gonna go straight to the last place we should be going right about now, which is the literal gates of hell, which are underneath the museum. There, we're met with Crowley holding Sarah hostage at gunpoint, but it's cool because we're MLG and aggressively de-escalate the situation. After that, despite everything we've half understood telling us that we need to be here or else millions of people will regret it or something, it turns out that we did indeed misinterpret the prophecy as Mr. Key acts as a literal key to open up the portal to hell or wherever this is supposed to be, and we reassemble the stone for some reason, thinking that the thing that's sole purpose is to hold on to and then release Lucifer's soul when the time is right will do anything but that when the time is right, which is literally right now. There are two endings you can choose from. The bad ending, where Lucifer's soul enters Carnby, but Carnby forces it out to inhabit Sarah instead, or the bad ending, where you shoot Sarah to stop that from happening and the soul goes back into you. There is literally no way to avert Lucifer coming back. I admit I mistakenly got my hopes up about the Infernal Edition. I didn't look too closely into all the changes that came with it at first and thought there might be a chance, since they not only tweaked major parts of the gameplay, but also added whole new segments, that there might be a good ending in the Inferno Edition. Say, if you collected all of the roots of evil, Carnby would be strong enough to resist Lucifer's soul and the world would be saved. I even got my hopes up as I got a notification at about 80 root points that my persistence had grown stronger. But it turns out that was a developer oversight. While they did change the requirement for how many root points you need to enter the end game, they forgot to change the phone notification you got when you were strong enough to throw something over the barrier. So it still sends that persistence message at the old higher threshold. There is no good ending even in the revised version of the game. But hey, 
I did it, baby. I saw all the literal hell Alone in the Dark 2008 had to offer for you. No stone was left unturned. Everything hurts. So that's it. I promise you all I do it alone in the dark 2008 and I did indeed spare no expense to my budget or my sanity to make sure that we got the most exhaustive best possible version of the game. Was it worth it? Absolutely not. The game that is. After seeing the best possible version of this game, I cannot recommend that you go through the trouble to play it yourself. Unless you already have a PS3 ready to go and you've got a used game store that happens to have a copy handy, this is a no-go. And even if those things are true for you, the 20 bucks or so you'll pay for this game is a hard sell. Like yeah, it might have been like cool and revolutionary like back then, if anything, no it's not that. It was highly experimental and none of those experiments really went well. But today it's just... Hell, given the choice between this and Abermore, I would play Abermore, because at least Abermore is like funny broken. Like I said before, I have my doubts that the PC version will ever be well and truly fixed, because there's a chance that the means to fix it was lost when Eden Games had to go into liquidation and all the other original rights holders are gone. Speaking of which, the current rights holders of Alone in the Dark are just completely remaking the game, like for real remaking the game and not doing this sort of soft reboot crap, which while that was supposed to come out last month, it got bumped to January, which, you know, is pretty nice for me because it gave me time to go hard on this video. Like I said in the beginning of this video, in spite of everything I just went over, this sold fairly well. Yes, Atari SA wasn't able to recover from its downward trajectory, and someone else eventually did get to be the Dread Pirate Roberts of video games and don the mantle of Atari, and Eden Games did have a very bad time after this. But Eden Games recovered. Eventually, they were not only able to pull themselves out of insolvency, but restructure themselves as an independent studio that is still making games to this day. They actually just released a game that's achieved higher metascores than the oh-so-ambitious Alone in the Dark 2008. That game? Smurfs Cart for the Nintendo Switch. I am not kidding. It's sitting at a 70 metascore, which beats out Inferno Edition 69. This thickens the plot too. Eden Games mostly does racing games, with Alone in the Dark being an outlier. This adds more layers to the what the hell is going on with this game's creation as one, having your racing games guy doing a very experimental survival horror game is the one move that out WTF Sega having the Total War guys making the survival horror alien game. And two, why is the driving in this game so awful when the people known for making racing games were behind it? So I've said this before and I'll say it one more time. Alone in the Dark 2008 is a game that feels like no one was around to tell the developers no on any little whim they had, which resulted in an all over the place experience filled with features that are half finished or outright contradict each other. Why do we need three different kinds of health systems? Why are there these weird little things like stuff I've entirely skipped over, like the whole fire extinguisher mechanic or how you can tape glow sticks to serve as temporary light fixtures and other just little things that have like good uses, but are extremely specific. If this game maybe had a third or even half of the features it was packing, it might've been a more competent game. But then, we wouldn't be talking about it right now, would we? It's definitely not a quote unquote flawed masterpiece, which is a term that is stupid. It's oxymoronic. It's no, it's either a flawed like gem or something with potential or a masterpiece. A masterpiece implies it is perfect or near perfect. Uh, why do people keep using that phrase? Alone in the Dark 2008 is an interesting case study. It's something that you can look at and have a better time trying to discern what the hell were they thinking instead of actually playing the game. To misappropriate a phrase, Alone in the Dark is a game that's much too weird to live, but far too rare to die. It's like the fateful findings of video games. It's a perplexing oddity that stands alone in the dark. No, don't roll the credits just yet. There is a silver lining to all of this, and it's that thanks to this ordeal, I now have the means to record basically anything from the 6th and 7th console generations. I do have a PS2 and a PS1, which by all accounts should work the same with the analog to HDMI conversion pass through as the PS3 did, like when I forced it to output analog. I can now do Switch games like Tears of the Kingdom if I suddenly find myself with nothing else to do for 100 hours and want to invoke the rage of Nintendo fans. Here's a few weird little gems I just already have in my collection for the PS3 that might be possibilities in the future. Also, 
let me know in the comments if there's any 6th or 7th generation console games I should be keeping my eye out for in the future because I try to make a habit of hitting up all the used game stores and pawn shops that carry video games every month or so. And that'll do her. We made it, baby. Second to only the Kenshi video. This is my longest script I've done the year so far. And as I write this, it is the fourth longest script I have ever done. The third is Deus Ex Human Revolution. The second, the original Immersive Sim video back in 2019. And number one is this year's The Rise of Cyberbeep. That also means that explaining the fever dream that is Alone in the Dark 2008 took more writing and explaining and psychic damage than explaining the entire continuity of Bioshock. Man, I have been going hard on my writing this year. I want to thank you all for sticking with me for this. If you want to help out, there's always all the algorithm stuff. And if you're able to, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does make these insanely in-depth videos on extremely niche topics possible. And there's all sorts of goodies there like recipes for the cooking segments and full 4K unobstructed videos of Frisk, the sauciest boy. If monthly membership isn't your thing, I do have the super thanks available. And if you aren't able to do either of those or just don't want to, it's cool. Just the fact that you're here watching the video is appreciation enough. Let's sign off so I can work on some other stuff while there's still days left in November and maybe lie down for a bit too. Remember that no matter what you do, be it writing, drawing, dancing, or splicing together clips of Philips CDI Nintendo games to make the characters say silly things, what you do is not content. It is art. Content has been twisted into a means to take that creative spark that drives you to make wonderful things and reduce it to nothing more than algorithm goo to appease a boardroom. And you are worth more than how much you can make a line go up. Art is an inalienable reflection of you through the very process of its creation, and it has all your talents, your hard-earned skills, your inspiration, and your dreams woven into it. None of those things are worth being reduced to content, so get out there and fight against the contentification of everything by fighting for your art. You will make the world a wonderful place in the process. Stay saucy, everyone. Saucy boy. Hanging out in his new house, made from the yogurt box. Oh boy, that was some thunder. And some pancake mix box. He do be enjoying this roof over his head. Taking advantage of those mortgage rates. I really don't know what's going on in the housing market. I'm a millennial. I, I We were never given that. We were given chunks. Scritch. You're just the homeowner cat. People come to you and ask you for your wisdom. You are 10 pounds of pancake mix. Silly boy, that's what he is. Just a silly little boy that likes a silly little house. Can't even pet him because he's so bunkered in. Oh, he's closing his eyes. Oh, I guess it's nap time, guys. We'll have to come back later to ask homeowner cat what his wisdom is.